You're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO Television. And now, here's two guys that can both dunk a basketball in their dreams, Evan and Joe. Welcome to Mick and T Sports Report here on CHCO TV. I'm Joe Tykowski down in New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm Evan McFarland, still here in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, Canada. And this is episode 17. We are moving. We are moving. There you go. Wow. And I need more hands soon. <laughs> as Amelia Welch said in the opening, neither of us can dunk a basketball, although I did throw a perfect alley-oop to my much taller co-host once, and he back-rimmed it. I, uh, that's a lie. I can dunk a basketball, but uh, in turn to that, I'm also not allowed to play with the young kids at the elementary school anymore. Their parents are mad at me. <laughs> Uh, we have two great uh, guests coming up, but first I wanted uh, to talk a little bit about my first COVID vaccine shot that I got uh, in late February. Uh, we'll have Evan play the interviewer role. He'll be uh, Michael Enright, former longtime host of CBC Radio. Um, why don't you hit me with some questions? All right, yeah, I have this all written up. So Joe, you recently got your first vaccine and uh, I guess everyone's a little bit interested to hear how things went. So first off, I'm terrified of needles, did it hurt? My screams were so loud that they reverberated throughout the entire building. Um, oh, no, great. actually it did not hurt at all. Very, uh, no, no pain at all. Okay, yeah, it looks pretty quick and easy. Uh, how about any side effects so far? Um, I think I got better looking, but that's just that's just my opinion. Well, I'm, that's not really setting the bar that high. <laughs> How about uh, what do you think's the best part about getting it? Uh, the sticker. Yeah. yeah. Is, it, yeah little, is it scratch and sniff? The little sticker they give you. To put, actually, the best part was the lollipop. I got great. Oh, it was awesome. I got great. Thanks. Uh, I was gonna. I, I thought these would be a little bit more serious questions. So my last question was uh, maybe to lighten the mood. But any funny stories that might have came out of it? Uh, there's always a there's always a good story involved with me. So I'm walking in to um, get the vaccine, and there's this elderly woman in front of me who's probably 85 or 90, and she's shuffling along. So I asked her. Do you need a, any help at all? And she said, yeah, if you're going to hold my hand while I walk in. So I said, ah, this is like a Lifetime Channel movie here. Um, <laughs> so I helped her in. And then once we got inside, I said to her, um, you do realize that if there's only enough left for one shot, I'm going to push you out of the way so fast you won't know what hit you. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, it was a very, really well organized. Uh, it's like clockwork no pain even the following few days um i was uh, pleasantly surprised so hopefully i encourage everyone out there to get it and i know you'll be you're a little behind me but hopefully you'll be getting yours pretty soon yeah it's, it's looking like it's going to ramp up for us fairly quickly but uh that uh, that story didn't help your boys get credibility was there for a little bit eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's all in good fun okay now um for Love the Leaf, uh, we promise you that we are going to get Evan to quiz me on those 13 provinces and territories in Canada, but we'll once again not be on this episode, so I know you're disappointed. Um, but Suspense, because, man. Just keep, keep on pushing it back. <laughs> but because I truly do love the Leaf, um, I've been watching the Women's Curling uh, Championships from Calgary, the Scotty's Tournament of Hearts. Um, so for you trivia buffs up there, the winners for your next trivia night were Team Canada from Manitoba. And it's sort of a neat thing you guys do that the defending champions are called Team Canada. Um, yeah, I mean, typ typically that if it was an Olympic year, that would be the team that represents us at the Olympics too. Okay. And on our next episode, we'll have the results of the men's curling where our uh, interview guest Mark Nichols and, and his team are competing. So we'll have that next time. All right, let's go to a quick music spotlight. Last time we went with just Evan. So this time we will go just with me. And this is a woman from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, right across the water from downtown Halifax. Her name is Mo Kenny. And her tune is called Unglued. So we'll see if we can get a little of that to play. 
It's Mo Kenny. Yeah. So, so good, man. She's, she's awesome. Seen her a couple times. Very catchy tune. We'll give it a few more seconds here. There does get a chorus coming up here. There you go. That is Mo Kenny. Okay, we're going to go right into um, the first interview here. So now let's take a look at our interview with wide receiver Kayon Julian Grant of the Canadian Football League. Today's guest was the first pick of the Montreal Alouettes football team in the 2019 CFL draft. He's from Toronto, but attended St. FX University in Nova Scotia, where he was a two-time team MVP and finished his four years as the school's career leader in all-purpose yards. Let's welcome in Kayon Julian Grant. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Great. All right, let's get going right off the bat. We'll go south of the border. Who's your favorite NFL team, and what did you think of last month's Super Bowl? I don't like currently I don't really have a favorite team but growing up I always liked the Falcons based off of my dad playing there and I was a big Michael Vick fan so I have more so favorite players now as opposed to teams okay so your, then, dad, so your dad go ahead the Falcons yeah he, he spent some time there with them okay nice and what did you think of the Super Bowl uh I, I was I was rooting for KC to win but it's hard to bet against Brady and uh, Mahomes can only do so much, in my opinion. So it was just, it was just tough to watch. Yeah, he uh, needed a little bit, a little bit more help on the offensive line. Though Evan is a Patriots fan. Oh yeah. Yeah, um, we're going into a bit of some uh, tough times right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. It's like only something that a Pats fan can really be upset about after the the run that we had. <laughs> and I am a I'm a Giants fan, so I always remind him that we are two and zero against the Patriots in the Super Bowl. So it's all yeah. good. always that reminder. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, we're just getting going here with Kayon Julian Grant of the Montreal Alouettes. We'll be right back after this short break. You're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. Welcome back to Mick and T's Sports Report. As always, I'm Evan McFarland here in New Brunswick. We've got my co-host, Joe Tykoski, down in Connecticut, USA. And today's guest is Kayon Julian Grant from the Montreal Alouettes. Kayon, with uh, the 2020 season being canceled, I was just wondering like, what your thoughts were on that and uh, your comfortability in the decision, as well as maybe what did you do and, uh, to keep yourself kind of up to date in training and exercising right now? Uh, so when we first went into lockdown, it was just a lot of just home training I could do, just running on the field, doing whatever I can, trying to stay mm -hmm. fit with my siblings, of course, just trying to encourage them. But over time, it just got repetitive in the sense where I was training and then it was to like no avail. And, and like, we're just like left in the dark for a bit. And we just, it's like, what are we training for? At, by the end of the day, we're, we're professional athletes. We're going to train regardless. But it was just, it was just, it was just tough, like mentally. But yeah. to keep track, really, I was just trying to keep my siblings engaged with their, because they're athletes as well. So I want to set an, set an example. Mm -hmm. So did a little home project, made a basketball court in the backyard, oh. and yeah, yeah. It's got to be until now. It's got to be a little tougher because football is not really kind of sport you can practice on your own compared yeah. to. To any other sports that's got to make it tougher for you but to make it easier too so after the, our little bonding experience with the basketball court i, I bought a jug machine so they have fun with that shooting the footballs to me catch that's cool oh nice nice now i um was looking up your background and i noticed you were a successful two-sport athlete in high school and in fact uh you played back in the day 
Yeah, you played for the number one team in Canadian high school basketball at St. Michael's. Um, what made you decide to play football in college as opposed to basketball? Uh, I would say, like, the decision brought me to, like, my grade 12 year. Uh, I had a pretty, like, I was pretty optimistic with both sports, actually. So I was looking forward to having a good season with basketball and football. So football, we went to Ohio. I had a, a great game against the number one team, Muller, at the time. I think okay. uh, Sam, Sam Hubbard went there. And so I had, like, probably, like, 200 all-purpose yards or something like that. But then I got hurt that year. And I was just so keen on just trying to keep pushing through and pushing through because I'm like, hey, I, really, I don't have any film. I, but I, so I need to get as much as possible, but I'm not obviously going to produce as much as I could because I was hurt. But I would just say, like, overall, like, basketball was always, like, my first love. But football came to me, and I, I just started to love it. And it was just so much easier. It, it just came easier to me. And at the end of the day, I'm 6'2 with good posture. <laughs> now, what position did you play in basketball? I played point guard to small forward just because I played defense. I can I could guard any position at the time. Okay. I actually saw a YouTube clip of you making a steal in an absolutely outrageous posterizing <laughs> dunk. It reminded me of myself back in the day, but there was no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, it was a, a pretty impressive. Uh, I'm sure you, you've watched, oh, thank you. uh, watched it a few times. Joe was yeah. the guy who uh, who had the ball stolen from him. That's what it reminded me. <laughs> yeah, no, my sibling. My when it first happened, my siblings would always just run it back and keep, keep replaying it for me. Yeah, of course. Always good. Evan, you got another hey, question? Hey, on. We know uh, our our friend of the show and former interviewed uh, AD of Saint FX, Leo McPherson, puts together a real good sports team. So we know that that that's a draw to go there. But uh, maybe academically, what was your favorite thing about the school that you were a part of? Uh, I just really loved like it being a small school and small class sizes. Like, you know, I think I feel it's rare. I only been to St. Fex really but from what I've heard that you don't really get to be on a first name basis with your professors mm -hmm. which classes did you enjoy most in school uh I enjoyed a lot of my kinesiology courses but uh I really in, like enjoyed my art classes as well okay they all got a lot of like I did a lot of uh, drawing and like painting classes. Cool. Excellent. And like art history. They all got on my case because when we interviewed Leo, I mispronounced the name of the town. I pronounced it in Pigmish. <laughs> not that it's the easiest name around. Yeah, it's not, it's not at all. But that's why a lot of people just call it the Nish. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Um, now I noticed that your father also played for the Alouettes, which is pretty cool, and that he played um, for the Atlanta Falcons in the NFL, and also that you have quite a large family. You're the oldest of the kids? Uh, I'm the eldest, but I have an older step stepbrother. Okay, and how many total in the family? There's 10 of us total. There's seven of us, including myself on my mom's side, and then my three siblings on my dad's side. Okay, and are, are any of your brothers um, or sisters also athletes? Uh, pretty much all except for two. My older brother, he's no longer playing basketball. My stepbrother, and then I have a sister who's not really into sports. Okay, and who wins the family battles uh, on, the, on the basketball court? Uh, I haven't faced uh, my brother Noah. Uh, he's at Alberta, but I haven't faced him, but I like to think of myself, but I haven't really played basketball in so long, so he should be able to beat me, but competitive drive, who knows? Okay, good, good. So you're hoping that the CFL is back on in 2021? Yeah, fingers crossed, I hope. I'm just, just got to stay ready, right? That's it. And explain for our American viewers, because they always ask me, the one point in the CFL, it's called a rouge. Yeah. And so what do you, what, how do you get the point? 
Uh, I believe it's a punt or a field goal just going through the end zone. Okay, so if you don't return it? Yeah, if it just goes out of bounds. Yeah. Okay, okay. We always, Growing up, we would see the CFL once in a while and wonder what the heck. Yeah. That, that one Man, point. That, that was a, just be a, uh, we, had, we had some, we had some – we had some weird practices, like trying to defend against rouges. Like if it's, if it comes down to a close game, like yeah. a last second game, punting it out the end zone, punting it back, like it's crazy scenarios. Uh, odds odds makers must hate it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's really special to get a, a professional uh, player on the show. Uh, he is Canadian Football League player Kayon Julian Grant. Kayon, thanks so much for coming on the show, and best of luck in the 2021 CFL season. Thank you for having me, guys. Great it was a pleasure. Pleasure. After the break, we'll be talking potatoes. We'll go from football to potatoes as we head up to Prince Edward Island for another edition of Small Town Spotlight. You're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. It's time for another edition of Small Town Spotlight here on Mick and T Sports Report. Since CHCO TV is available on Bell Satellite, television throughout Canada, you can watch our show on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Friday nights if you live in Clyde River, Nova Scotia, Swan River, Manitoba, or Rainy River in Ontario. And as always, you can watch the show on the CHCO TV's YouTube channel, where we hope you'll subscribe. As we crisscross our way across Canada's 13 provinces and territories, our ninth edition of Small Town Spotlight heads to one of my favorite parts of Atlantic Canada, the province of Prince Edward Island, also known as PEI, and the town of O'Leary, located on the western end of the province. With a population of just 815, it's located 90 minutes from the capital city of Charlottetown. It's also the home of the Canadian Potato Museum, named by CNN as one of the world's top food museums. Without further ado, let's welcome in today's guest, Donna Rowley, the museum's manager for the past 21 years. Donna, welcome to the show. Hi, Joe, thanks for having me. Okay, um, PEI has less than 1% of Canada's overall population but over 25% of the Canadian potatoes are grown in PEI. So tell us a little bit about your potato industry. Uh, the industry here on the island is a huge industry. It's actually probably the number one cash crop that we have here on the island. Uh, we have about 180 growers uh, on the island growing uh, commercially and privately. Uh, the commercial business, of course, is where most of the money is made. Uh, and they grow probably upwards to about 100 different varieties here on the island. So an island as small as we are, we can, we can produce uh, quite a few uh, pounds of potatoes. On average, it's about uh, 80,000 acres of potatoes that we, uh, we grow. Uh, it has dropped a little bit over the years, but uh, it's kind of leveled out to be about 80,000 acres that are planted and harvested every year. Okay. Now, would you be able to tell the difference in the taste of a PEI potato compared to other parts of Canada or, or the US? Well, um, in all the years that I've worked at the museum, we've had many people come through um, telling us about their own potatoes and where they come from and, and how they can tell a difference that our potatoes taste really different than how their own taste. Now I've had potatoes from, I wanna say, I don't wanna say all over the world, but I've had uh, been to many different places and I've tried them and I can, Probably a little bit biased to say, but I do actually like our potatoes the best. So we were going to give you a blind taste test with a couple, like an Idaho <laughs> potato, and uh, um, couldn't couldn't swing that. Um, if we visited uh, the museum there, what would would we actually see? So when you're coming to the museum, you're coming into a small community of O'Leary, is where the the museum is located, and it's kind of a hub of uh, the western end of Prince Edward Island. Uh, the first thing you're going to see when you come in our parking lot will be our giant potato, our big potato that stands outside. 
Would that be it? That's it. That's it right behind you. So it stands about 14 feet high and it's about seven meters in diameter and um, sorry, seven feet in diameter. (laughs) And uh, a lot of people stop and that's the first thing they'll do is get a photo op with the potato before they actually come in the museum. So it's kind of a curiosity thing. People, you know, either just stop to have that photo taken and maybe continue on their way or the curiosity of what could possibly be in our museum kind of draws them in as well. So when you come in, then the museum itself is a very educational uh, facility. So we uh, offer the the history behind the potato, kind of the the little path that this humble spud has made on its way from where it was originally found to uh, how it made its way here to Prince Edward Island in the early 1700s. So the museum itself consists of our interpretive center, which focuses on the history of the potato there's tons of videos and information on the potato itself. We have some quirky little videos that are funny. Uh, we have others and very scientific videos as well. So it kind of draws interest from all different types of people. Uh, we also have a huge display of farming equipment. So a lot of our equipment is from the 1940s, 1950s uh, uh, era before the tractor played a big part of the industry. So people kind of get to see the hard work that was into the industry before um, tractors and machinery kind of helped uh, um, make it a little bit easier. So on your way um, out of that area, you kind of get drawn back to our kitchen area. So we have a little potato country kitchen in here. So we offer a potato menu. So you can get fresh cut fries, baked potatoes. We have soups and chowders here. Uh, Poutine is popular as well. And then we do have some desserts uh, on the menu as well. Now, I, I, noticed, I noticed in the gift shop, uh, you sell potato fudge. We do. Yeah, that's what a popular potato? little, yeah, that's a popular little treat. Um, before COVID, everybody would get a sample of the fudge as they come in. So with the COVID now, it's a little bit different to offer people uh, samples and stuff to uh, as they come into the museum for a taste. But uh, the fudge is made actually every day here at the museum. So if you take some sugar, some chocolate, some um, vanilla, and of course mashed potatoes, and a little bit of butter, and you mix that all together, this is what uh, makes our potato fudge. So we do that uh, every day daily, and it's sold in our gift shop. And again, people, if they ask for a sample, we would definitely uh, give them a taste of it to see if, if they like it or not. Uh, we actually do uh, uh, experiential tours where they uh, can actually make their own fudge. So it's part of a package deal that we offer where they get to go visit an actual potato farm and visit with a farmer and kind of see their operation kind of behind the scenes. And they come back, have lunch with us, get to tour the museum and then make their own fudge uh, that they can take home and share with their family and friends. Well, if I ever stop up there, I just ask you to please don't tell my diabetic doctor that I... <laughs> Fudge, we yeah. would just give you a small a small piece you could have a small sample <laughs> and lastly i noticed your restaurant has something called seaweed pie please do explain <laughs> that's actually a very light dessert that we have and there's actually no potatoes that are found in our seaweed pie uh, it's actually from another um industry that was huge here back in the, the probably late 70s early 80s and that's called irish moss Uh, So the Irish moss is harvested around uh, the shores of Prince Edward Island, and it was harvested either by horse, um, by boat, or by hand, because sometimes it would get washed up close to the shore, so the horses could go out and gather it up with a scoop behind their back, or uh, people would gather it with forks. They would take this uh, Irish moss and sell it to, uh, it would be commercially sold, I guess, Uh, and they would take this moss and cook it down, and there's a thickening gel comes off it called carrageen. Now, if you were to check an ingredient label of different things like chocolate milk or toothpaste or ice cream, you'll see the carrageen as an ingredient in a lot of those products. And it's actually derivative from the Irish moss. So this Irish moss, we do the same thing. We take that gel and we make it into our pie. We add it to our pie and it's topped with a dream whip and a fresh made strawberry or blueberry sauce. Now you're trying to kill me there, John. <laughs> we love to feed people when they come to PEI. <laughs> all righty. Well, as I tell all of our small town spotlight guests, if you ever make it down to our area in Connecticut, I'd love to show you around our state. And I'd take you out for some of our world famous thin crust pizza. And some actually have mashed potatoes as a topping. But Great. I'd have to ask you to bring your own on there. <laughs> I would love to try some. Thank you. Great. 
She is Donna Rowley, manager of the Canadian Potato Museum in O'Leary, Prince Edward Island. And if any of our viewers do end up visiting the museum over the summer or at any other time, please make sure you say hello to Donna and tell her you saw her interview on the show. Donna, thanks so much for being a part of our small town spotlight. Great, Joe. Thanks for having me. Very informative interview there with Donna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was good. Um, quick question, Joe. Sure. How many uh, Frenchies did you have to visit down in Connecticut to get a PEI sweatshirt? <laughs> the PEI sweatshirt. It's a, a little good old fashioned American brown nosing there. Um, now, I just figured because the one before where I interviewed the kid from British Columbia, everyone asked why were you wearing a Brooklyn t-shirt and I just tried to wear something casual. Yeah. Um, so I figured you had to go with the PEI, but all righty, let's gotta go. Get you, uh, gotta get you a PEI dirt shirt. Go for it. I'll take any, any gear, free gear, the freer the better. Yeah, for sure. Shout outs, who do you have? Um, I'm going to leave this one pretty wide open, but uh, with the weather getting really nice this weekend and some good golf on TV, I'm getting the itch. I'm just going to give a shout out to all the members of the Algonquin Golf Course that I hope to see in a couple weeks when I get back out there. Good stuff. I'm going to give my shout out to Steve Medancy, a friend of mine from here in Connecticut, who was just named Superintendent of Schools in Southington, Connecticut. Very impressive. Uh, awesome job by him and also say hello to his wife Christy and their three girls Casey, Ellie and Dory but congrats to Steve. Yeah congrats to you. All right that's it for episode 17 of Mick and T Sports Report. I'm Joe in New Haven. And I'm Evan still here in New Brunswick. Thanks to the birthday boy Patrick Watt and everyone yes. at CHCO TV in St. Andrews. Uh, we got such a great response to our closing catchphrase that we're going to continue using it until we've totally run it into the ground. Well, I'll, I'll add something extra based on this episode. So until next time, peace, love, and PEI potatoes. <laughs> this is Mick and T's Sports Report on CHCO-TV.